One minute ago, California's entire coastline reportedly jumped six feet overnight, an event so impossible that it would overturn everything scientists know about coastal stability. For decades, the land here has only budged by millimeters per year. If this claim is real, nothing from shipping routes to insurance contracts is safe. But what does the data really show? And can any instrument confirm the impossible? The true investigation starts now. California's coastline, stretching more than 1,200 miles, is under constant watch by a network of ground stations and satellites. Every year, scientists measure how the land moves, sometimes up, sometimes down, but always at a pace so slow it's barely noticeable. The numbers are precise. In most places, the coast shifts vertically by just zero to four millimeters per year. That's about as thick as a credit card. Even in neighborhoods built on soft, reclaimed land, where the ground can sink a little faster, the change is still measured in millimeters, or at most, a few centimeters over several years. Decades of data from GNSS receivers, in SAR satellite imagery, and tide gauges all tell the same story. The land creeps, it doesn't leap. In the San Francisco Bay Area, for example, sediment compaction causes some districts to drop by more than 10 millimeters per year, but uplift, the ground rising, is far rarer. And when it does happen, it's usually tied to local changes like groundwater recharge or oil extraction, never anything close to feet in a day. To put this in perspective, sea level along California's coast has gone up about six inches over the last 100 years. That's the result of both the ocean rising and, in some places, the land slowly sinking. Projections for the next generation suggest another six to 14 inches by 2050, depending on how much the land moves underneath. But nowhere in the record books or in any peer-reviewed study is there evidence of the entire coastline rising by even a fraction of a foot overnight. The instruments that track these changes are built to catch the smallest shifts. GNSS stations can detect movement down to one millimeter. INSAR satellites scan the coast every few days, mapping ground motion across entire counties. Tide gauges, some in place for over a century, record every tidal swing and long-term trend. With this kind of coverage, even a modest bump in elevation would set off alarms across multiple networks. A sudden six-foot rise would not just break the pattern, it would overturn the very foundation of how coastal change is measured and understood. The reality is simple. All the normal, everyday motion along California's coast is slow, steady, and measured in millimeters. Anything greater would stand out like a mountain on a flat plain, demanding immediate scrutiny from every tool and expert available. A claim this extraordinary demands a forensic approach. Every instrument, every reading, every timestamp under the microscope. The lead geodetic investigator begins by pulling the raw R, I, N, E, X files from every coastal GNSS station in the affected zone. These files record satellite positions and ground movement down to the millimeter, captured every few seconds, and archived by agencies like UNAVCO and the National Geodetic Survey. Alongside the data, station logs are checked for any hint of disturbance, antenna swaps, maintenance visits, even firmware updates. A single misinterred antenna height or a poorly documented repair can mimic a sudden jump in elevation. Photographs of the monument and surrounding ground are reviewed for signs of tilting, flooding, or tampering. Independent software chains are required for the radar evidence. INSAR satellite imagery is brought in for cross-examination. Interferograms from both ascending and descending orbits are processed using multiple software packages, each step logged and versioned. The phase unwrapping process is scrutinized for edge artifacts or isolated pixels that could create false signals. Only when independent software chains agree and both radar tracks show the same step at the same place and time does the signal pass to the next round. Instantly, tide gauge records are examined. These sensors, some in place for more than 100 years, log sea level changes every few minutes. 
If the land truly jumped six feet, the water would appear to drop by the same amount at every gauge along the uplifted stretch. Instantly. Calibration files, datum references, and maintenance records are all checked for recent changes or errors. Any mismatch between gauges or a lack of corroboration with the G, N, S, S, and INSAR signals is a red flag. Ground truth leveling surveys provide a final check. Survey teams compare pre- and post-event benchmarks along the coast using traditional optical leveling or modern RTK GPS. Any true uplift must show up in these ground truth measurements, matching the time and magnitude recorded by the remote sensors. Red flag. The redundancy rule is simple. No single instrument or agency can confirm an event of this scale. GNSS, INSAR, tide gauges, and leveling must all show the same step at the same time in the same place. Any outlier, any unexplained gap is enough to throw the entire claim into doubt. Reference checks include frame updates and atmospheric models. The audit does not stop at the data. Reference frames are checked for recent updates or epoch transitions, which can create phantom jumps if not handled correctly. Orbit and clock products are compared between international agencies. Atmospheric corrections, troposphere and ionosphere models are reviewed for anomalies that could spoof a step signal. Transparency is logged at every stage. The investigator documents the chain of custody, who processed which file, what software, and parameters were used and when. Only with complete transparency and full agreement between all lines of evidence can a six-foot uplift move from viral rumor to scientific fact. Anything less, and the claim fails the gauntlet. Along the Palos Verdes Peninsula, the land at Portuguese Bend has been quietly shifting for decades. Here, the hillside moves downhill in slow motion, carrying homes, roads, and even utility lines with it. This is not the dramatic coast-wide uplift some imagine. It is a textbook case of landslide mechanics. As the main body of the landslide moves toward the ocean, pressure builds at the toe, the lower edge of the moving mass. That pressure forces the ground upward, creating a subtle bulge. Geologists call this toe uplift, and it is easy to spot in cross-section. The land rises in a gentle dome, sometimes lifting driveways or tilting trees. The scale, though, is always limited. At Portuguese Bend, the fastest rates of vertical motion barely reach a few centimeters per year, and the affected area spans just a few hundred meters. Even during sudden slip events, the uplift measures in inches, not feet. The forces at play, saturated clays, block movement, and soil compression cannot deliver a clean, uniform step across hundreds of miles. Landslides like this are hyper-local, leaving clear fingerprints in the landscape, but never rewriting the elevation of an entire coastline overnight. No known landslide, no matter how active, has ever caused a six-foot jump in elevation across a broad region. That kind of change simply is not in the playbook for slope-driven ground motion. Groundwater and oil extraction have long shaped the vertical motion of California's coast, but always within strict limits of scale and speed. Human-driven signals tend to be slow and local. In many cases, when water is pumped from deep aquifers, the ground above sinks, sometimes dramatically, as seen in the Central Valley. But the reverse can also happen when water is returned to the ground. The land can rebound. In Santa Barbara, a major groundwater recharge project began in 2018. Over the next five years, scientists measured several millimeters of uplift a rare and welcome shift after decades of subsidence. This change, though, played out over years, not hours, and was confined to the basin itself, nowhere near the scale of a coastwide event. Oil and gas operations tell a similar story. In Long Beach, the ground dropped by more than 30 feet during the 20th century as oil was extracted. Engineers responded by injecting water into the old wells, stabilizing the land, and even causing it to rise back a few centimeters. These cycles are closely monitored with INSAR and GNSS tracking every movement. The largest human-caused uplifts, whether from water or oil, rarely exceed a few centimeters per year, and they always form patchy, irregular patterns on the map. No engineered process has ever caused a uniform, synchronous rise across hundreds of miles of coastline. The physical mechanics make this clear. Groundwater recharge and oil field pressure changes move the Earth slowly limited by the permeability of rocks and the reach of wells. 
Even the most aggressive industrial operations cannot produce a step change of six feet overnight. The Santa Barbara uplift stands as the most recent and best documented example. Millimeters per year, basin-wide, and gradual. Anything faster or broader would not just be unprecedented. It would defy the physics of fluid flow and rock deformation. With these mechanisms ruled out, the search for an explanation must turn elsewhere. Container ships approach the breakwaters at Los Angeles, Long Beach, and Oakland, expecting channels dredged to precise depths. 53 feet at Los Angeles and Long Beach, 50 feet at Oakland. These margins are tight. The largest vessels, ultra-large container ships, draw nearly 52 feet when fully loaded. Harbor pilots rely on these numbers and time arrivals to high tide for just a few extra inches of clearance. In an instant, if the coast rose by six feet, those channels would effectively shrink to 47 feet in Los Angeles and Long Beach, and just 44 feet in Oakland. That wipes out the safety buffer. Ships scheduled to dock that morning would be at risk of grounding before they even reach the turning basin. A port operations manager explains, if we lose even two feet of draft, we embargo the biggest ships. Six feet? We would have to halt all deep draft traffic. No one moves until we know the new bottom. Dredging is planned months in advance, not overnight. Emergency surveys would scramble to confirm depths, but the ships already inbound would be stranded, either forced to anchor offshore or offload cargo in stages, causing immediate bottlenecks. The supply chain would seize up within hours. Cargo scheduled for just in time Delivery would pile up at sea. Schedules would be shredded, with ripple effects from rail yards to warehouses across the country. For these ports, every inch of water counts. A six-foot overnight uplift would trigger a logistical crisis with no historical precedent. When the tide never returns, the shoreline changes from a living border to a graveyard almost overnight. A marine ecologist, boots crunching on rock, surveys what is left. Muscle beds that once filtered the surf, now exposed far above the highest tide, begin to dry and crack within hours. California mussels, adapted to survive six or eight hours of air at low tide, cannot withstand a full day of sun and wind. By the end of the first afternoon, their shells are sealed tight, but water loss and rising body temperatures push them past their limits. Within 24 hours, nearly all are dead, sometimes much faster in the heat. Barnacles and limpets, masters of clinging to the splash zone, close up to conserve moisture. It buys them time, but not much. Without the return of the sea, most perish within a day, their bodies shriveling in the dry air. Kelp, tethered at the lowest edge, fares even worse. Giant kelp and feather boa kelp, built for constant submersion, lose vital water in just a few hours. The fronds bleach and collapse, leaving empty holdfasts where forests once waved. Tide pools, usually bustling with anemones, snails, and small crabs, turn silent. Sea anemones contract to retain moisture, but after 12 to 24 hours above water, even the toughest cannot survive. The loss ripples outward. Shorebirds lose their feeding grounds, and scavengers arrive to pick over the remains. For the ecologist, each empty shell and stranded kelp blade is a record of lives cut short, a living system erased not over decades, but in a single irreversible day. Insurance contracts along the California coast are written with disasters in mind, earthquakes, tsunamis, storms, but not for the ground itself rising six feet overnight. Most policies spell out what they cover in black and white. Losses from earth movement, subsidence, landslides, even uplift, are almost always excluded unless tied to a named peril like an earthquake. The force majeure clauses, meant to handle the unpredictable, rarely mention unexplained vertical jumps. Ports, shipping companies, and property owners would find themselves in a gray zone. Claims adjusters would reach for their manuals, only to find that an uplift of this kind isn't listed. Payouts freeze. Contracts require not just proof of damage, but a cause that matches policy language. 
An actuary running the numbers would see a scenario with no precedent and no clear liability. The process grinds to a halt. Insurers and policyholders would clash over definitions, while lawyers debate whether a six-foot step is an act of nature, an engineering oversight, or something else entirely. Authoritative data is the only way forward. Until a regulatory body or court rules on what happened, billions of dollars in claims would sit in limbo, ports unable to operate, businesses unable to recover, and communities left waiting for answers. The absence of an uplift clause leaves a vacuum, turning every policy into a question mark. In this kind of contract chaos, the only path forward is evidence strong enough to classify the event and unlock the gridlocked claims. Startups specializing in satellite analytics race to release their findings, touting near-instant detection of ground shifts using high-frequency radar and machine learning. Traditional agencies like USGS and NOAA counter with decades of ground-based records and established audit protocols. The debate is not just about which numbers are right. It is about who controls the narrative when the stakes are this high. A data integrity specialist, fluent in both legacy GNSS logs and the latest INSEAR algorithms, reviews the evidence line by line. Every dataset must be released in its rawest form. R-I-N-E-X files for GNSS, unprocessed synthetic aperture radar scenes, and minute-by-minute -minute tide gauge streams. Only with full transparency can outside experts rerun the analysis, hunting for processing errors or overlooked artifacts. Freedom of Information Act requests flood inboxes at public agencies, demanding access to every log, every calibration file, every email about the event. The specialist flags any data gaps, unexplained jumps, or mismatched time stamps. In past controversies, raw data dumps and independent reprocessing have resolved disputes that software updates or frame slips first ignited. Here, the same scrutiny applies. No claim survives without a clear, documented custody and public access to the numbers. The war over what happened, and who gets to say, plays out in code, audit trails, and open files, not press releases. A real six-foot uplift along California's coast would leave an unmistakable fingerprint across every line of evidence. Confirmation starts with a step change of at least one meter, appearing in the raw global navigation satellite system data from multiple independent stations, all at the same time. INSEAR imagery must show a matching coast-wide band of uplift, with both ascending and descending satellite tracks in agreement. No edge artifacts, no isolated pixels. Tide gauges in affected harbors would record an immediate drop in sea level, exactly mirroring the measured land rise. Leveling surveys, whether by optical methods or real-time GPS, would have to replicate the step at ground level, matching both the timing and the magnitude seen by remote sensors. Inland reference stations, just a few miles away, should stay flat. Any sign of regional tilt or patchiness points to a local effect, not a true coastline-wide event. The checklist for ruling out false positives is equally strict. A discovered frame shift or error in the international reference frame instantly disqualifies a vertical jump. Mismatched phase stacks in INSAR, multipath or weather artifacts that are not co-timed across sensors, any data gap that breaks the chain of custody. Only when every instrument, every agency, and every audit step lines up, without exception, does the claim move from rumor to fact. Anything less, and the event is chalked up to artifact, error, or misinterpretation. When it comes to the extraordinary claims about the California coast, the standard is multi-sensor, multi-team, and multi-method proof. No shortcuts, no one-off signals. The California coast remains under relentless scrutiny, not upheaval. As billions in trade and fragile habitats depend on stable ground, every sensor reading today is more than data. It is a safeguard against chaos. Extraordinary claims force us to question, but only verified science can dictate response. In uncertain moments, skepticism is not hesitation. It is our best defense.